Our X-Files. Welcome to Our X-Files Vault. Regular people talking about unexplained phenomena. UFOs. Ghosts. Cryptids. Hidden archaeology. Weird science. Our stories. Our takes. Our X-Files Vault. Native American paranormal investigators, Hiro and his brother Sean Clan, are unearthing the supernatural. Their explorations have been seen on Paraflix, Ghost Adventures, Peacock TV, and Discovery Plus, shedding light on the spirit world's many mysteries. This is Hollywood X Vault. I'm Lise, and I thank you, Hiro and Sean Clan, for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We really appreciate uh, you guys reaching out and look forward to discussing all types of matters. Happy to be here. We look forward to hearing your unique perspectives on the supernatural as well. So jumping right in, what motivated you two to pursue this line of work? Um, so uh, Unearthing the Supernatural was founded, uh, I would say, about a little over a year and a half ago. Um, but my brother and I were, especially my brother himself, he's a medicinal medicine person in our tribe. And he's been doing that for over 20 years now. So as little kids, we were, I grew up with him, seeing him go on his trainings and learning how to become one with the world in the in Native American aspect, as well as not just with Navajo tribe, but multiple, multiple tribes in general, I guess you can say. So with that, um, I partook with ceremony with him uh, multiple times throughout our lives and over these 20 years. And we've come to really perfect how we uh, communicate with the other side and spiritual beings uh, themselves. So with that, I had the idea one day, it was like, because we're really big fans of uh, ghost adventures and other paranormal groups and everything like that. So we're just like, why don't we show the world how Native Americans view the paranormal? How do we teach the people who are living on the lands that we used to take care of and everything like that? How do we teach people how to be one with the land? And as well as not just the land, but the spiritual aspect of things as well. So that is the main mission of what Unearthing the Supernatural and our paranormal group is all about, is we're trying to educate people on how to basically, if you're confronted with the spirit, how would you um, dissect the situation and be able to communicate with the spirit and see what it needs and see how you can help them? Because obviously, if a spirit's trying to make contact with you, it either wants you to do something or it needs help. So that's essentially what Unearthing the Supernatural was founded to do. And my brother can tell you a little bit more about himself and his journeys that he's gone on. It sounds yeah, like so, a very go ahead. Sounds like a very noble mission with a very compassionate angle. Definitely. Yeah, so um, unearthing the supernatural, uh, like my brother has say, stated, I've been <clears throat> I've been doing ceremonies for over 20 years now and um, helping a lot of people out, not just Native Americans either, from a lot of different races. And I've come to uh, specialize. Uh, whether by choice or by n not by choice um, into like the darker side of things, putting people back into balance, healing, and then also diving into like uh, the death world and different beings of that nature. And we've done, I'd say thousands of successful ceremonies. And my brother came up to me like, hey, why don't we go to some of the world's most haunted locations and try to help these beings out because one thing that we noticed was that everything seemed to be black and white according to kind of like Western paranormal investigating. And there's a lot more to it. The world's a lot more complex. Um, so they're like, why don't we kind of introduce who we are and how we interact with these beings and maybe teach some people. So we're like, okay, yeah. So that's where we picked up the camera and decided to start investigating some really well-known locations and yeah, here we are just booming and yeah, being successful in just one year's time of recording. 
Well, it's great to hear that your message is being so well received. I'm sure a lot of people who aren't familiar with Native American spiritual practices are fascinated by the information you have to share. As you've said, Western spiritualism and Western paranormal investigation tends to view spirits from a very antagonistic angle. Definitely. That's uh, one thing that seems very, uh, I don't, I don't want to say wrong, but uh, it seems uh, like it's not the only path, the only angle to go about. It seems, like I said, it's black and white. You have those investigators that are very antagonistic, very threatening, very um, aggressive. And then you have those other investigators who are too light, who are kind of too reserved and don't want, they close their mind off to what is actually there. We as Native American paranormal investigators understand there's a lot more to it. It's not just black and white. You have beings who are good, who are doing bad things. You have beings who are bad, who try to wish to do good things and everything in between. And so you'll see us when we investigate, we are very kind, very respectful, no matter what being it is. Um, and we try to provide genuine help with what we have and what we know and provide genuine communication, genuine talks. Um, and then when we're confronted with an enemy that chooses to confront us, then we go by the old ancient teachings of the warriors aspect and showing no mercy to our enemies. That's kind of how we do things. So it's very broad and very, a lot of variety with who we are. It sounds very flexible, like it's based on reading the situation and being intuitive rather than coming into a situation with a preset idea of how you want to tackle it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, pretty much how we, how we enter every single investigation is how we view it is we view it as a ceremony. Essentially, every investigation we go on is the patient is the spirits themselves. We find out what their problems, what their needs are, and whether they're being held there against their will by either past trauma in their lives or a demonic entity or any other entities. There's like literally with all the information like of the different types of classes of spirits that are in the spiritual realm that could be playing all sorts of different types of factors on why sometimes some spirits are in some uh, buildings and all that or locations or the earth or stuck somewhere, you know, it essentially, you know, when we go into an investigation, that's why we investigate, you know, we investigate the reasons why these spirits have not moved on. And we help those who want to go on to the next world. But we do run into some cases to where spirits do want to stay. So we provide them aid, we provide them offering, we provide them energy to be able to defend themselves while they want to stay in this world and we we don't um i guess you can say we in, we encourage them you know we support their decision of staying on this realm this earth you know and we provide the means for them to be able to successfully stay in this realm do you believe that people can coexist with the spirits they perceive <laughs> as malevolent say in a purported haunting i'll take that one yeah go for it yeah, so when it comes to uh, coexisting with what some perceive to be malevolent, you have to understand where, what uh, honestly, what type of spirit it is. There are beings that uh, us as indigenous people have lived alongside for since the creation of, uh, of time from our creation stories, even before that. So we are taught how to interact with beings and not all beings are cute and cuddly and kind, but all beings have a purpose. All beings have a reason for being here. And so we, as, as humans, as beings of this physical realm, have to understand what's around us. There are some places that you are not supposed to go. You let the beings, that's their, their home. You leave them alone. You let them take care of their things. If your home just so happens to be a house for one of these malicious entities, a level of respect, a level of communication, and a level of understanding must be made in order to be able to live and coexist with these beings. They understand you are occupying a space and you understand they are occupying a space. Living with mutual respect and um, I guess a cohabitation uh, is something that's very important. Thank you for elaborating. Now, you've once mentioned being the guardian of a sacred mountain. Could you please tell us more about that? 
So at the age of 13, I was selected to become a part of, a, I guess in English translates out to a high council. And it's like a cultural exchange program. In this cultural exchange program, I was able to interact with a lot of different tribes, a lot of different people, a lot of different ways of thinking and belief. And that kind of shaped me into being who I am. There are four of us on the Navajo Reservation who are classified as guardian. And we are told to protect these sacred mountains. We are told uh, our, our border mountains. And we are told to kind of maintain the ancient knowledge and ancient teachings of these mountains. And so with me being the guardian of a Western mountain, that's kind of my role and kind of all the teachings that go with it as far as for thinking, for war, for um, dealing with the dark side of things. It, the Western mountain also represents stages of life. And the Western mountain stage of life is a, adulthood, um, learning to become one with yourself, and also taking care of a family, taking care of your mind. And so there's a lot that goes into these teachings and becoming a guardian has really opened up uh, my world and everyone around me's world to more than just what can be put into a box. So, In the episode on Vulture City that you guys did, you mentioned that there are things that shouldn't be disturbed. I know you've just touched on that, but I'd like to ask, what kind of things particularly are you referring to? Now, when I did that ceremony at Vulture City and we found that these things shouldn't be disturbed, the beings in particular that we came across were giants or uh, yaitso or monsters and tribes all across this nation all have history and not just tribes but people all over the world have stories of monstrous beings giants beings that kind of um, wreaked havoc on people that wreaked havoc on the human race and so that location was actually a burial site a sacred site for when these beings were taken away from this world and their bodies were left to to, to be maintained and taken care of buried underneath the earth and not to be disturbed now that it's being disturbed, um, the active gold mine in Vulture City, that dark energy that these beings had is being released and is being spread around. And that's kind of what leads into the Vulture City curse and people didn't quite understand it. They didn't understand exactly why things would happen there at Vulture City. And when we went there, it's like, the, this is a place that shouldn't be messed with. Sacred sites are to be protected and maintained, whether they're holding some sacred knowledge whether they're holding sacred herbs or they're holding a back a dark past. And so with that being released and not being uh, given it to due diligence, these bad things start happening. Vaulting off of that, in another episode of Unearthing the Supernatural, your team explores Canon Diablo and a railroad town that sprang up while a massive bridge was being built over the canyon. When the bridge was completed, the town was abandoned, reducing the community to a proper ghost town. Allegedly, every marshal in that town who donned the badge died in the line of duty. Were spirits involved protecting the sacred land, perhaps? Yeah, the, um, there's a old, te old stories of that area, the Canyon Diablo area. There's old, there used to be an old trading route, as well as there's a lot of I guess creation stories uh, there's a lot to go into I probably I won't have time to really go into that but there are some things that happen there but when it comes to Canyon Diablo and the ghost town that was established or the town that was established there the town of Canyon Diablo that was based off of greed and literally if you think of the old wild west and the stigma that Hollywood has kind of made that would kind of kind of be the only town that really stood out as the wild west you have prominent figures such as um the Billy the Kid and all of these other outlaws throughout time and history that made themselves notorious have traveled through there. There was no law. It was brought about by greed. Uh, there's the railroad trying to go through. So there, that's a whole nother package right there. The railroad and their, I guess, greedy, greedy, uh, greedy, how do you say the agenda, the greed of agenda kind of took out a lot of natives, uh, displaced a lot of Native Americans and killed a lot of the sacred sites and a lot of the sacred animals that used to roam about that area. So there's a lot of factors that add into it. The railroad, the, the old 
uh, legends and stories and creation stories of that area, as well as Wild West towns, the brutality, it kind of just festered within that location. Kind of, kind of all goes uh, to the question of like, you know, what, what, what time frame do you want to learn about? <laughs> you know, you want to learn about the human time frame when, when we were here, or like kind of go back even further before written history and everything like that. Sounds like a rich and storied history with many, many decades, even centuries to explore. An interested party would probably have to spend years researching and immersing themselves in the lore and the culture in order to get a true grasp on uh, Native American spirituality and all the you know, related phenomena. Exactly. It'll take a long time. <laughs> yeah. Now, in the case of spirits being involved in protecting sacred lands, could perhaps a native shaman or a spiritual person call on a spirit to protect a sacred space? So yeah, that's where uh, at Vulture City, um, like I said, we don't just kind of pick and pry at things and poke at the bear and then leave it alone after it's pissed off. We provide solutions. So Vulture City has kind of been uh, almost like an HQ for us since we've really discovered it. And uh, working with the owners, my brother is actually helping leading the ghost tours there. As far as for placing spirits there to help protect and guard an area, we helped reestablish those lines with the traditional tribes that are from that area. Um, Navajo is not necessarily from that area, but the, some tribes have become extinct. Also the Yavapai Apache, the Gila, Gila people, all these tribes that are around. We kind of reestablished relations with them. And on the spiritual side of things, we reestablished the protecting, protections and guardians there. They protect the innocent people. Unfortunately, there's not much that can be done about the mine. That's, um, there's a bunch of legal human aspects to that. And there's also um, activists and people trying to go against uh, greed corporations like that from desecrating sacred sites. So that's what we're doing on the human side of things. On the spiritual side of things, the spirits are there to try to mitigate and maintain what's there and try to contain the, the entities that are uh, unfortunately being released. And that's a constant battle. Here's a question that the uninformed I find often have. Could a spiritual person or a shaman summon an aggressive spirit for the purpose of protecting, similar to how a government might use dangerous technology or weaponry to protect its country from invaders? That is a very, that's kind of a rough subject to talk about because Think, it think is about to protect an area. Yeah. Think about ahead, um, New, New Mexico. Yeah. Like so, what the, that ceremony that you did over there. So, the yeah. So with that one, the uh, I am not condoning any regular person to really try to step into this world unless you know really what you're doing. Um, that's to be said forefront. But shamans, medicinal people, sacred people who do have the knowledge and the power will summon uh, aggressive beings, aggressive entities to perform tasks. Not necessarily evil. They're not necessarily evil beings. Um, if you're a person of, uh, who does good and fights for the good, you will never summon an evil being to really do anything bad. You are never to pray against anyone, but you can summon beings who can aid you in a particular task. One such being is we had to summon a death spirit in order to find someone who had passed away. And so that's, not necessarily a, a ceremony that should be done lightly or treated lightly and there's a lot that goes into that but we could not find this particular person so we had to use other means and other beings that are in that realm to find and locate him and we did so successfully pretty pretty much you know you you ask <clears throat> you don't ask them to do anything bad but there are roles you play in the spiritual world that like good has their boundaries good spirits cannot go to certain places they don't have certain roles they cannot do certain things in the spiritual world so you have to contact somebody who does deal with those things in the spiritual world sometimes they're not the nicest of people but you know you don't summon them to do bad you know you summon them because that's what they do you know hence we summon a death spirit to kind of help you know find a, uh, somebody that was missing at the time so in a sense 
that's kind of like the the rules and boundaries behind that yes you can do it but you're not supposed to summon bad things to do bad you know to do bad deeds you know there has to be a purpose there has to be a reason behind it the, the lines are very fine mm -hmm. and you have to be a very controlled disciplined person to not cross those lines mm -hmm. in certain circles western spiritualism is starting to experience a resurgence in popularity there are many young people who express an interest in the paranormal and becoming paranormal investigators across cultures what advice would you give a young person who's curious about dabbling in the spirit world so i would just say be careful you know if you if you're going to be going into a world have some knowledge have some protections on you if you're going to be going into this because we've been doing this for over 20 years now and not not as in a sense investigating but the spiritual ceremonial side of things and one thing we always go in is we always make sure we know what we're doing we have protections and you know go into it having a good heart you know because that's one thing that you know we, we've come to find out is spirits can read you spiritual entities can see through you you know they can know your your fears they know your past your intentions your heart everything so if you're going into paranormal stuff for greed and all this other stuff they'll know it and and that's one thing you know is i always see with a lot of young, newer people is you know sometimes they go in they're just like oh yeah i got a camera so i'm just gonna go in here and do this and that it's like okay you guys got to understand there's rules, regulations and everything that go into spirituality. And and that's one thing that we wanted to kind of do with our group is, you know, let people know it's like, yeah, you guys can investigate, but take these teachings that we're going to give you, you know, these basic uh, knowledge that we're going to give you guys to help give you that extra protection, you know, know when to step back and know when to take a step forward when you're communicating with the paranormal side. So if my advice be careful and just know and know what you're doing and have a good purpose and mentality behind it. To kind of go off of what he said as well, uh, us indigenous people, we're raised from childbirth for certain things we can and can't do, things we can, can and can't interact with, how to act and how to behave in a ceremonial spiritual setting. That's ingrained within us generations and generations ever since from the moment we're born until the moment we go pass on into the other realm that is going to be instilled within us and that's kind of what gives us a little bit of a different edge compared to most people who aren't haven't been around this world and don't necessarily know what to do um we've been given that sacred knowledge and ancient teachings to interact with it you talk to most native american indigenous people they have the ancient teachings and taboos that they're not supposed to interact with things like this they stay away from places like this for reasons because these entities and these beings if you don't know what you're doing they will play with your mind they will get you sick and they could possibly do worse so you have to know what you're doing have to know yourself no i always want to tell young people is to know yourself because these beings will put you through tests and whether you're ready or not, you will learn about yourself. You will learn who you are and how strong of a person you really are. And I'm not talking about strength muscle wise, I'm talking about the mind and the spirit. That's how you're raised, and who you are as a person will be tested. So be very careful out there and understand who you are and have some teachings. Like we, we see ourselves almost like the uncles that are teaching the nephews out there. <laughs> you gotta eh, be careful, nephew, what you're doing. Be careful, niece, what you're doing out there. Take this with you and be very careful. Sound advice for the uninitiated. <laughs> to ask you one question about a topic that captivates many amateur paranormal investigators, the Wendigo. Could you tell us anything about that lore? So the Wendigo, or the Windigo, or the Windica. Uh, those are the different names. There's also many other different names. Mainly comes from the Northwest area of uh, indigenous lands by the Great Lakes and the Five Rivers. Uh, that's kind of where this particular lore originates from. Now, this particular entity uh, has been kind of eschewed a little bit by Hollywood and like Stephen King's, uh, I believe it's the Pet Cemetery. 
It has been a strewed, a skewed a little bit um, for Western beliefs, traditionally speaking. And I, by no means am I am I an expert on those tribes, but from what I've been told, in case I ever were to encounter one, these beings are beings that are cursed, uh, possibly once humans, or an entity that represents. Um, I guess you could say cannibalism, uh, loneliness, greed. Uh, it is said to come about when an, a person is alone, is starving, often uh, attributed with cold and freezing weather. And so a person will become selfish and they will kind of turn to cannibalism and eat their own. And when they turn into this and they eat the human flesh, their soul becomes tainted and usually taken over by what's called the Wendigo. And a lot of people uh, can see the Wendigo as a representation of greed, of loneliness, of separation. And it's an evil spirit that will take over someone who is afflicted with these things. And it, you can tell someone's a Wendigo by uh, their uh, insatiable lust for human flesh and to just to do negative aspects and kind of how i connect to that a little bit uh, as far as for on the western side of things we have a being called the skinwalker Yenigloshi, and they often use death they often use um, like grave robbing and they'll uh, kind of fix a dead body to use their witching so the similarities as far as with using death using human flesh human bones to afflict pain and misery onto whoever they're trying to infect. So one thing to understand with the Wendigo is that it's a warning that uh, was given to, to people, to the people of that area, to take care of your kind, be kinship, community, watch out for each other, feed each other, make sure no one goes hungry, make sure you're protected and taken care of and be part of a community. Don't be a loner, don't be outside the community and if you are and you kind of shun yourself or get shunned because of the deeds you've done these spirits and these entities lie in wait to try to harvest and take your soul i think that's a fantastic message across cultures and times and you know genders i believe that the uh wendigo having such an unexpected positive almost aspect to it is truly a wonderful thing and I'm sure a lot of our listeners don't know that. Definitely yeah it's with a lot of traditional stories and belief especially when it comes to dark entities or dark beings that there's a message as to why this is why you don't do this this is why you do these things you make sure you take care of each other you make sure you take care of your kind you make sure you're uh, you're kind, you give food, you don't just hoard food for yourself. Um, you don't experience greed, you, you try to be um, sharing, you try to be kind. And if you're not, these are the consequences. These are the things that can happen. And these are the entities lying in wait, hoping you do these bad things. Well, thank you so kindly for sharing your wisdom. It's been a fascinating trip through your primer on Native American spirituality. And it's my hope that our listeners are inspired to do some legitimate research of their own after listening to this show. Definitely, that's what we encourage. We want you to look into it yourself. We want you to be able to be well-versed, well-experienced into what you're dealing with, but have an open mind because these spirits will teach you a lot more than what any books can.